Welcome to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. I am your host, Molly Southgate, and today I'm interviewing... Hi, Joe Smith. Hi there. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. So, can you tell me about what you've written? Certainly. Um, I write dark fantasy novels. Um, I've written uh, six up to this point, including the one that's just come out. Um, I write a series of four books called The Long War. Um, which came out in, I think it was 2013 um, onwards, one a year. And um, this current series um, is a trilogy, and the book that's just come out um, is the second part of that trilogy. It's called Form and Void. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I've been reading this, uh, The Sword Falls, and it's so oh, okay. excellent. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad you enjoy it. It, it is the second part. The, um, the Glass Breaks is the, the first part, and there's some of the, sim- some of the same characters. Um, yeah. I'm actually not sure whether it could be read standalone or not. I think, it probably, no, I think it probably could be. To a degree. I, I realized, I was like, oh, wait, <laughs> this is part of a, th- <laughs> these are two books. Oh, no. So I'm going to go yeah. back and read the first <laughs> one. But, yeah. So you mentioned that you write dark fantasy. What drew mm-hmm. you into that genre? Um, I like being going to make up what happens next, I suppose. Um, if you're writing in a real world, then there's all sorts of conceits that you have to follow. Um, whereas if it's fantasy, it can literally be anything. Um, I like the idea of um, worlds that only exist in the mind. I suppose you, you can't say, yeah, this is set in London and people know what London is. Whereas if I say something is set at a place called the Severed Hand, no one knows what that means. They've actually got to rely on me to, to explain that world to them. And I, I like that. It's kind of a responsibility as well. Yeah. Yeah, Definitely. That sounds a bit pretentious, actually. I don't, didn't mean it to. No. I, I, just lo- I just like the idea that um, I can make up anything I want. There's no rules. Yeah, that's that's great. No, I, I also write fantasy stuff, so I, oh, I definitely cool. agree with you on that. Mm. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the importance of fantasy writing? Well, at the basic level, it's escapism. Mm. Um, what you're basically doing is you're leaving the real world, whether it's a real world you love or a real world you hate, you're going somewhere that's completely different. Um, as, as a writer, um, what I tend to say is it's the only thing I do that doesn't make me feel I should be doing something else. Um, just when I'm writing fantasy, that's all that matters. You know, that's, um, it's a world I'm in, the characters there are mine, I can decide what I want for them. Um, and, you know, it enables you to get out of the world for a little while. Mm-hmm. Therapy, if you will. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> that's um, why I use it anyway. It's not, not true for all writers. Yeah. When you're writing, do you ever feel like caught up in it almost? Especially like as you just described it, it most in, of the in time, a lot yeah. of ways is like a therapy. Yeah, most of the time. I mean, I write at night almost always. Um, I don't know why. I just got probably because I had a I had a day job for most of the time. Mm-hmm. And um, when sort of eight o'clock in the evening comes around, there's like a little ritual where I'll make myself a cup of coffee. I'm, I, I smoke as well, and I probably shouldn't. I'll, I'll roll myself a cigarette, and I'll just you know I'll, I'll get into it. And there's just something wonderful about after a couple of hours looking back and seeing there's like oh three pages of stuff i've just written even if it's crap you know it's, it doesn't really matter to me that I've, I've just got stuff down and there's a progression there like yeah it's, it's there's not really another feeling like it i don't think yeah definitely do you ever feel so this is kind of an out there question but i've had a lot of authors feel this way on the show um like when you're writing you almost kind of like get taken away by the characters or like they do things that you're kind of surprised by yeah yes that, that is very true um I, this isn't a spoiler but there's a character um in the book you probably wouldn't have met him yet in the book in the bit you've read um called reese his, um, his, his name is the, the wolf's bastard everyone refers to him as for various <laughs> for various reasons and um, and he's not a main character he's a he's a um, supporting character but I, I sort of use him because I, I've got this complete understanding of how he reacts to things. So he's almost like the voice of the audience for me as a writer. Um, and that came out of nowhere. That was just a character that suddenly developed this way of cutting through the crap of other characters. Um, and and I can write so much stuff from his point of view and not realise I've done it. You know, like um, I almost have to rein it back sometimes and say, no, I've got too much Reese in there. I need to get rid of him a little bit. Just because he, he's sort of my, um, in role-playing terms, he's my player character. Oh, that's real. Yeah, that's really interesting. So, I would assume he's one of the easier ones to write. Is there one that's really hard to write? Um, it's one that's really hard to write. That's interesting. Um, 
a lot of my certainly in, in these series of books, the, the main character is a woman called Adeline Brand. Mm-hmm. And um, in my previous series as well, I had a lot of female characters. And I get people asking, you know, do you struggle to write women? And, and I, I've never found that particularly difficult. But I sometimes find the relationship when I'm writing from a female perspective, I sometimes find it difficult to write how women re- relate to men in a way that I don't find it difficult, obviously, writing how men relate to women. Mm-hmm. I think that's sort of the um, the big barrier of a bloke writing a woman or a woman writing a man. I think we're more similar than people realize, but it's the relationship between the two that can sometimes be difficult. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. That's something really interesting that your book does as well, where you flip perspectives too, and you, the characters Mm -hmm. have different Mm -hmm. genders and different outlooks Mm -hmm. on life. What was that like trying to almost like switch perspectives emotionally, like into that character as you were writing? (laughs) it's a lot easier than my first series because my, my first series was third person limited. Oh. And I had, um, God, I don't know how many characters, something like 20, 30 characters across four books. Um, and, and for some reason I made things apocalyptically difficult for myself by suddenly changing to first person and only having two characters. So if anything, it's easier. Um, with first person, because you're in the person's head, so you can explain a, a complicated thing with just a single line of dialogue. Or a single line of, you know, it occurred to me that, or I thought that. Whereas if you're writing the third person, um, show, don't tell is much more of a um, a rule. Whereas first person, it's not quite so much of a big deal. And I write them separately, too. I tend to write, um, I don't jump from one to the other. I'll write a, one person's whole section and then another person's whole section. I do it like that. Yeah. That, that's really interesting. Because I, I, w- I was curious about that as I was reading, too. Because I, I was wondering how you how you did that to get into the characters' heads. Well, the, the two in the book you're reading, Oliver Dornclaw and Adeline, are so completely different <laughs> that, that um, I don't think I could have jumped from one to the other without going a bit mental. So I sort of, I'd write, because I do it in chunks of three chapters each, like part one, which is Oliver, is three chapters from him, his perspective. Then I jump to Adeline, three chapters from her perspective. But, uh, but I have a break between those sections. I'll write Oliver's and then I'll break and then I'll write Adeline's. Um, so I don't kind of start writing with Oliver's voice in Adeline's sections and vice versa. Because I've caught myself doing that in the past. Oh, um, like, yeah. Yeah, obviously with editing and stuff, I try and catch it. I've got a very good editor as well. So he, he always sort of has a, he doesn't have a go, but he always says, AJ, you're, you're, this is Adeline's voice here, not Oliver's. Watch that. So, you know, I have him to thank that I've managed to keep the two separate. Yeah. Do you have any tips for differentiating characters like that, especially when you're in – two different characters' heads. Yeah, um, know what they're doing in that moment, really. I mean, you don't necessarily have to get right back into their arc, but, like, I don't know, if, if like, when we first meet Adeline in the second book, she's she's having a fight. Uh, she, we sort of jump in media res, she, she's having a fight with somebody. Mm-hmm. And um, in that moment, that's all she cares about. There's no wider plot going on there, just she's a woman who's having a fight. And that's all you need to know about it. She's not this other person, Oliver. So just know what they're doing in the moment, I suppose. And once you get that, it quite easily flows into their uh, their characters becoming consistent. As long as you know what they're doing in that moment, on that page, in that sentence. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a mistake a lot of people make, I think. That, um, seeing everything as a as a chapter or a book without, you know, rather than seeing things as a paragraph or a sentence. And I think a lot of people could do could do well to just knock everything down to what is the person's motivation at that specific moment. That's just my opinion. I'm, I'm sure I'm wrong. But there you go. <laughs> oh, oh no, I I really like that. I, I was just in, very intently listening right then. Yeah. Um. So, can you tell me a little bit about your world building process? Mm. Um. I draw a lot. Um, all of the maps and things I drew myself. The maps at the front of the the books. Oh wow. Um. Yeah, and. Uh, Actually, the, the ones that you're you're reading, I've only got a couple of maps. My my um, earlier series, of, there's like six or seven maps across all the books mm-hmm. of cities and countries and things. And uh, I draw them myself, and they're normally the first thing I do. Um, I just sort of imagine, you know, who lives here? Why have they called it this? Um, is it near a river? What's the river called? Is it near a mountain range? What's the mountain range called? Why did they settle there? Um, are they the first people that have settled on this land? Yeah. Um, with this one... It's um, the idea was it's a young fantasy world because so many of the classics of Tolkien and things are thousands and thousands of years old, which are beautifully rich and wonderful. 
Um, and a bit of me wanted to write a young world that hadn't been, didn't have those thousands of years. Um, and so this is 168 years old, I think, the world mm-hmm. in these books. And these people didn't originate here. They came from somewhere else. So they arrived here and they have limited knowledge of their own history. So their law um, doesn't span thousands of years. It's very much about their cultures um, and their heroes and things like that. And I love the idea that it's just a young world. Um, yeah. So it can be it can be explored and there's things that they don't know about, which is obviously one of the main plot points, um, things in the world that they, they aren't prepared for. I, I really love that. And that's something that you don't see in fantasy very much at all. Um, mm-hmm. And from what I've experienced, too, sometimes the lore of like what happened in when it was an older world could be used kind of as a crutch to go back on for plot devices but having it be a young world is really interesting and there's nothing wrong with i mean some of my favorite books are like thousands of years oh yeah and some of it's amazing but a a bit of me also thinks that um if a civilization had been prospering for a thousand years they might have discovered electricity by now (laughs) Uh (laughs) or the internal combustion engine or something i don't know maybe that sounds silly but I, i just like the idea that these people, although to them, obviously, their world is the most important thing ever, but the mountains and the forests don't care. You know, the, um, the, the things that have lived here for all that time don't care. Um, and in these books, there's a distinction between the main characters who are a particular race called Eastron and the natives who've lived here, you know, for all of their time. And they're very animist. They're very, um, uh, primitive, you would say, but not really. Um, they're sort of based more on, um, uh, Polynesian cultures and native cultures. Um, yeah, so that's, <laughs> cool. that's my world building process. Very long winded, yeah. yeah, sorry. Um, okay, so this is kind of a diff- totally different question. But no, so on your website, you have another job as well. What's it like to manage a day job and your writing? And can I, you share I, any tips for people I, who I have don't to have do a both? website, is the first thing I'll say. As you mean to me on my Goodreads page. Oh, not your website. It was, um, I believe it was Fantastic Reads. It was not, it oh, wasn't Goodreads. It was a s- separate, it looked like a publishing company. Oh, maybe. I, I don't really Google myself or anything, so I'm not sure. Oh, I don't have, it had a I website for you. Press. It had a whole bio for you. Oh, okay. I've not read that. Um, yes, I have a day job. I'm a, a youth worker. I work with um, troubled kids and stuff and tutor them in uh, things like English and creative writing. Um mm-hmm. At the moment, because of the, the global pandemic stuff, it's quite easy because most things I do is virtual so over over the internet or on, on the phone, so I don't really need to leave the house. But before before all this, it was difficult, yeah, because I'd um, that's one of the reasons why I started writing in the evening because um, I could get home from from work, chill out, have some dinner, whatever, and then eight o'clock onwards was my writing time. Um, and I found that compartmentalising it like that actually helped. Um, especially because I was dealing with some quite heavy stuff at work, some of the kids I was working with and stuff. So um, that's where the escapism comes in, the fact that I can get away from some of these nasty stories I hear during the day (coughs) and just um, make up some crap about swords and monsters for a few hours. Yeah. When you were writing, and like especially during that time, did you have anything to get you into like the writing headspace, like certain music or anything like that? Um, This is actually, I get... I've, I've mentioned this to people before that have asked me about it. I, I've developed the habit of, of watching TV shows and films while I write. Mm. And, and that sounds odd. A lot of writers have told me that's really bizarre. But I've got, like right now, in fact, I've got my um, the book I'm editing, the third part of this series, which is also finished called The Sea Rises, um, is minimized in a Word document in the bottom corner of my screen. And I've got um, half of um, the latest series of The Expanse in the top right. <laughs> And I'll watch, I'll be watching that sort of half-heartedly watching that while writing. And I don't know that I'm, I'm, I suppose some people would find that very difficult, but I, I can't write in silence. I've never been able to. Yeah. I, I actually did that. Um, I, yeah, November, November. Um, mm-hmm. cause I was doing NaNoWriMo and I watched a lot of glow <laughs> during my writing time. <laughs> I've not seen it. <laughs> oh, it's great. Um, I don't, I don't tend to tend to watch much fantasy, really, because I'm. I, I get people say, "Well, have to, were you watching all Game of Thrones while doing it?" But no, no not at all. It's more um, I, my personal taste of horror and sci-fi, mm. strangely, rather than fantasy. So, do you like to read and like horror and sci-fi stuff too, or do you mainly stick I, to fantasy? 
when I'm reading, I, I, I almost never read fantasy. I've, I've re- oh. I have read a lot in the past. But, I mean, it's one of those weird tautologies that writers often don't have time to read. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that is often the case. I don't read anywhere near as much as I did before I started writing. Um, but most of the books I read tend to be either sort of black comedy, urban fantasy kind of stuff or um, horror. Yeah. How did, so you just said it there when, before you started writing, how did you get into writing? Like, when did you start? Do you mean professionally or just? Just in general. I've always written. I mean, it's it's anything I've ever wanted to do really Mm -hmm. is. I mean, it's no, to some extent I'm living my dream. You know, I mean, I'm not a millionaire or anything, but um, it's the only thing I've ever wanted to do. Right. And when when I was a kid, I wrote loads of stupid stuff about heroes with swords and things. (laughs) Um, then when I was at university, I, I, I've had a few articles published about youth work and um, dealing with uh, young drug addicts and things like that, um, which I was doing for a living for a while. Um, the, the, my first novel, which was published in 2013, the reason I wrote that is because a friend I had a summer holiday off because I was working in a school, and a friend of mine who's actually subsequently died, and one of the books is dedicated to her, oh. challenged, challenged me and said, why don't you write a book over the summer? And I thought, yeah, she's taking the piss, but I had a go, and... As it turned out, I wrote it in sort of three and a half months, which at the time I didn't know was like ridiculously fast. And every other book I've written has taken about a year, but that, my, that, that very first one, The Blackguard, the first book I wrote, um, only took me about three months. Um, and I had no idea whether it was any good or anything, and I sent it off, and uh, the second agent that I sent it to wanted it. So I, I didn't go through the sort of struggle of being rejected a thousand times, oddly. I, I don't know any other writer that didn't. So people hate me for that as well. <laughs> well, I think I think that's amazing and very, very lucky. <laughs> lucky is the word. Or definitely lucky. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah I've that, talk- that was how I got in. Oh. I, just, I just wanted to know if I was any good. And yeah. And you were? Because <laughs> now Apparently. there's all these out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's really interesting because I've heard a lot of stories about people like getting into writing and going through all of these long journeys of trying to get published. Yeah. And I think that that is. I missed out on that whole section. Really, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing, but a bit of me does feel quite guilty about that. I mean, in, in, imposter syndrome is a real thing. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's yeah. quite easy to, you know, it's quite easy to think, oh, this is all an elaborate bull practical joke until, you know, you, you actually see your stuff in, in hardback. That's when it mm-hmm. sort of becomes, becomes real. So I've got a stack of, um, all of my books next to my next to my desk where I'm sitting at the moment. Just so funny to refer back to anything. They're all there, and I've got they're all dog ended with um, bookmarks. And I, I kind of write in pencil in my own books, which is really disrespectful to, <laughs> to, to books. <laughs> but I, they're, they're mine. I've got loads of copies of them, so I want. But um, yeah, so th- that's the bit when it becomes real. Up to that point, uh, it, none of it seems real to me. I suppose. Yeah. Do you remember, I, this is kind of a tricky question, so if you can't answer this, that's totally fine. But do you remember when, like the first moment that you were like, oh my goodness, this is real. I'm actually published. I actually made a book and it's out. I, I actually do. There's a very specific thing about this. Um, so when I mentioned when I was at university, I was writing stuff. My best friend <laughs> bought me a, um, a fountain pen. I don't remember what the circumstances were, but he, he was convinced that I'd get published because he read, read a short story that I'd written. It wasn't fantasy. Um, and he was convinced it was brilliant. And I, and I had no confidence at the time, so I didn't bother sending it off. But he bought me a, a really nice, expensive fountain pen and said that um, the first book I get published, I have to write, um, I have to sign it to him using that pen. And um, something like 13 years later, um, I did. And the Aww. pen had been the pen had been lost and found, you know, a hundred times and I'd moved house a dozen times and stuff, but I'd always sort of managed to keep an eye on where it was. And, um, yeah, and the, the very first hardback copy of my very first book was signed with that pen to that friend. I <laughs> adore that. That is an amazing story. <laughs> it's actually true as well. It sounds like the sort of thing people would bullshit out, but it is actually true. No, I, I could believe that though. I could, <laughs> I could totally see that happening. I, Sorry, I mean, I, I read fantasy, so true uh, um so who are some of the biggest influences in your writing um in, in terms of other writers uh clive barker hp mm-hmm. lovecraft obviously i'm a little bit obsessed with um michael moorcock for fantasy probably 
Um, I like um, I like some Stephen King. I think he's a very he's very underrated. Uh, but I, I yeah I love some of his. I, I like the the fantastic and the uncanny, which is why I like Clive Barker so much because I think he's just got this amazing ability to to write uncanny fiction that just is a little bit off off putting. It's not always horror as such. It's just you know slightly slightly askew. I think the guy's got a brilliant mind. Um, yeah. I wish I could write like him actually. I don't know if you've read me Clive Barker, but he's he's a bit of a genius in my eyes. I actually have not. But um, my dad has read a ton of his. And so I was looking around. Um, the mm. bookshelf isn't right by me, but it's over at the end of the room. And there are a whole ton of his books up there for Clive, all, all these Clive Barker novels. It really is worth reading. It's probably my favorite book, actually, is a book called Imagica by Clive Barker. It's like a 2,000 pages or something ridiculous. It's massive. But it's oh, wow. amazing. It's just, it's not, I'm exaggerating, it's not that long, but it's just a brilliant book. And it's, um, it's hard to describe. I mean, I've heard it described as um, horror. I've heard it described as fantasy. Um, Clive Barker himself calls it fantastique, the Q. Um, I think he's, again, just trying to be pretentious. But <laughs> but it's just brilliant. It's just this uncanny atmosphere all the way through it. It's just a wonderful book. Wow. Yeah, that sounds really great. I'm, I will definitely check that out at some point. I've, I've, it's, I've it's always eyed to... those books on the shelf, just never picked them up <laughs> fully. They're definitely worth reading. I mean, he he is on fairly just called a horror writer a lot, which I don't think is the case. He does write horror, but I don't think horror is ever the main thing he writes about. Like the Hellbound Heart and Hellraiser and all those things which he wrote. I mean, they are horror, but there's a lot more to them than that. Yeah. And yeah. He's, he's probably the writer I admire the most. Yeah, that's awesome. So what, do you have a favorite thing about writing fantasy? Well, um, or just writing in general, too. I love writing. It really is. And that sounds really pathetic, doesn't it? But it's, it's the only thing I do that I genuinely get a kick out of. Um, and, and the more I do it, the more I slowly accept that I'm quite good at it. It's taken a long time. The more pride I have in it, which I didn't for a long time. For a long time, I just you thought I was um, this kind of crappy writer that someone was doing a favour for by publishing his books. Now, I actually have a bit of pride in it. So, no, I love it. It's just... Like you said, do I need to get in get in the mood when I start writing? Not really, because I'm looking forward to it. You know, that that point at eight in the evening, generally eight in the evening, when I start writing, is the part of the day that I'm looking forward to the most. Um, and if I'm doing something else and I can't write at that time, whether I start writing at ten or eleven in the evening, I'm looking forward to. It. I'm kind of rubbing my hands together with glee as I'm driving home, thinking, "Cool, I've got that great bit with, with Adeline to write." And, and, I, and I, you know, I thoroughly thoroughly enjoy doing it. That's a, that's an easy answer. I know, isn't it? Just saying that I love it, but. No, yeah, but that is, that is what it comes down to. I I understand that, and I think that that's fantastic. And you're really great at it too. Even though I did start at the wrong book, um, <laughs> I still immediately felt drawn into the world, and like it was really so immersive and captivating. I'm glad. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming on this show. It has been excellent to talk to you, and I just have one final question. And that is, what do you have coming up? What do I have coming up? Um, at the moment, right at this very minute, I had to stop to, to talk to you. I'm, I'm editing the third part in Form and Void. First part was The Glass Breaks. The one you're reading is The Sword Falls. And mm -hmm. the third part, The Sea Rises, uh, is finished. And uh, I'm just editing the very end of it at the moment. It makes sense. And it should be out. Obviously, with the pandemic, no one's quite sure, but it should be out uh, by the end of this year, hopefully. Um, so it'll be a complete energy. And then after that, I'm moving away from fantasy, oh. and I've got an urban horror book that, I'm, that I've started. Um, that, yeah, which is a completely different genre. <laughs> that's great. I will definitely keep an eye out for that new genre and any new books. And I highly recommend anyone listening to this do the same. All right. Well, thank you so much. Do you have any final thoughts before we go to the outro? Uh, no, that's that's that wasn't as painful as I thought. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm glad it was not painful. Um, I, I'm, I, I just get very nervous about these sorts of things. Oh, no, it's fine. Yeah. For Read Between the Lines, my name is Molly Southgate. I'm Edgar Smith. Let's end this the way all great stories end. Happily ever after. The, the end. end. Thank you for listening to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. This episode is hosted by Molly Southgate. It is edited by Rob Southgate and produced by Southgate Media Group. You can get in touch with the show at readbetweenthelines at gmail.com or you can send us a voicemail at 
708-887-9473. That was 708-887-9473. You can also find us on Instagram at Read Between the Lines Podcast. Thank you so much for listening.